So we don't have to wait any longer. Uh, I would like to introduce our superintendent. She'll be starting her second year, and here is Dr. Terry Cox Cruy. Welcome back. We're really excited. Another school year. Um, I bet you didn't realize that when you came this morning, you were going to hear about what I learned on my summer vacation. But I thought the whole time I was on vacation, I kept thinking about this opportunity in front of you and all the learning opportunities that I was experiencing while I was on vacation. And if you would like to participate in some dialogue with us this morning, I have set up a site for you to log on to todaysmeet.com backslash PGA. And if you haven't participated in a back channel before, we've been doing this throughout the school year with the principals because we have a large number of diverse principals across the district. We have some people who are interested in preschool, discussing preschool, and some people who are interested in, in discussing college. So we implemented that over the last um, year so that while we're in principals meeting, if questions arise, you can go ahead and put them out on the table. And it's especially helpful when you're in a crowd and audience this large. And we have people in the audience who will be um, assisting with answering any questions or passing along any suggestions that you have because we want you to be an active participant in our meeting today. So you might want to try this sometime with your class if you have projects going on and you want to monitor. I've used this quite a bit in presentations um, so that large groups of people can have their questions answered. So it's very easy. You just log on to todaysmeet.com backslash PGA and you enter your name to join or enter some initials to join and you'll see that I've already um, set that up this morning uh, welcoming you. So feel free to join and have conversations with your colleagues. It's a very different way of engaging uh, participants and for some people it's hard to get used to because people might be entering questions and things and not looking direct at the speaker. But I think that's all part of what we're doing today and learning in this world that our kids are engaged and they're multitasking all the time. So as adults I try to model that whenever I can. There's my picture of my vacation. This is what I had to get back to. As Deneen mentioned, I'll be starting my second year, and my first year was really, really exciting and active and never a dull moment. I know you can't imagine that, but that's how the school years are. So for me, I wanted to get back to something I knew. I wanted to go where it is so predictable. Every morning the sun rises, and when that sun rises, the same things happen day after day after day. And it doesn't matter when you go to the beach the same thing happens. The vendors show up, they set up, they put umbrellas in the ground for people, the walkers start walking, you've got lifeguards that, that show up, and at the end of the day, everything goes down and you start over again. And I thought, that's what I want for my vacation because I don't want to have to think about where I'm going and what I'm doing and, and all the innovation and the technology because we really pushed hard this year to, to really incorporate that in, into, our, um, into our classes and into our world. And what I noticed day two, though, really changed my mind about whether this beach experience was exactly the same as it had been before. I was passing by a mom and a baby in a stroller, and the baby was holding the iPhone like this, watching a video in the stroller, watching a video. And I said, wow, that is a different experience. So I can come to the beach, but there is still a lot of technology. The other thing that happened when I saw the baby with an iPhone, I thought, well, that's not so unusual. This is the first time I've come to the beach where I brought an iPhone, an iPad, and an iPod. The other piece that I brought with me was a speaker that I had received from a conference that I'd gone to several months earlier, but I never had time to really try it out to see how the speaker worked. The speaker is taunted to be used with your iPod or an MP3 player, anything that, that plays music you can hook up a speaker to. But it's one of those that you have to charge it. You, don't have, you can't replace batteries. So it just took me some time to figure out how I was going to hook it all up. And so this is what my free speaker looked like. Just this little thing, and I thought, you know, I brought this on vacation with me. I'm going to learn how to use it. And I did learn how to use it. And 
when I learned how to use it, I realized that the experience at the beach was a little different than when I was growing up and we carried boom boxes and things. Everything is portable, everything can go anywhere, and learning can happen anywhere, anytime, which is some of the tenets we've been working on in Next Generation Learning. So to get you engaged a little bit, because at the keynote last year, I showed you some video clips to really get people thinking about try one thing. And all year, every time I've been introduced to some new technology, I've been trying one thing. So this year, I wanted to ask if anybody in here took that charge and tried something new or have used some new technology like that in your classroom with an iPad that you would want to share with the group. I tried Edmodo for the first time this year, oh. and uh, my students absolutely loved it. I loved it as well, and I love technology. And it was a great way for me to do quizzes, polls online, provide some accountability, and allow them to use their Kindles, iPads, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say phones, but absolutely. If it's I'll tell on myself, and I did, right? This is a new year, so I can do that. It's in the past. It's a learning tool, right? It's all about, OK, so thank you for sharing and for sharing. We would like to share a prize with you. We have a speaker. And I'll show you guys that can't see across the room. This morning, we're going to be giving away these portable sound speakers. You can even put your iPod inside to protect them. And this will be great for podcasts in your room. Another thing to get students engaged. So throughout the morning, we'll have some more of these for sharing. So thank you very much for, for sharing that with us. OK, so I gave the charge last year at the keynote to go try some things. And I wanted to find out how we were really doing with that. So there's a superintendent student advisory team made up of high school students. And I asked them in the fall this question and asked them to get on Poll Everywhere. Again, another free resource if you'd like to try polleverywhere.com. As to educators, we are able to access those surveys and create our own for free. So I did some baseline data in the fall, and then I did uh, follow up in the spring. In the fall, when I said, how often each week do you get to use your own electronic device to participate in class at school? And you can see the results. About a quarter of our high school students said never. And then we had some, the most of them said, you know, once or twice a week we get to use our own devices. And then there were um, a very few amount that were using them multiple times, three to four times a week. When I came back to them in the spring, the same group of students, I said, I'd like to see now how much we're using them because we've had some time to kind of let it sink in that it's OK to bring your own device and use your own devices. And this is what they said then. So now we have about 70% of the students in spring of 2012 who said that they are pretty regularly getting to use their devices at school. So I wanted to check with Vicki Fields, our district uh, technology coordinator. And I asked Vicki, what do the numbers look like in our district for kids who are bringing their own devices and working on that? And she said, we had a huge jump in January. Well, for those of you who are not at the high school level, in January, I went to every high school and talked to all the freshmen and sophomore students. And I asked them um, to pull out their own device and I taught them how to download from the Apple Store a free QR code reader and showed them how to access all the information on the new Kenton County Academies of Innovation and Technology through scanning a QR code. So after January, we went from 700 student devices to 6,000. Now, I know that a lot of people are concerned that kids aren't going to use technology proper or they're going to do some things improper, and they probably will because they're kids. But it's really up to us to teach them appropriate ways to use them. Because if you get them engaged in what they're really doing, they can really do some amazing things. So on my vacation, I started looking for those kinds of opportunities, and I found Copper tone. I, I, you know, I was looking at everything. Like, what are other companies doing that are making them better? Because they're all using technology and they're all using things in a more innovative way. Copper tone now doesn't just have lotion; they have spray. And airlines now are improving, saying we're not bigger, but we're better. We have a higher level of quality. And so I thought on this summer vacation, I kept thinking, you know, everything. The function is still the same when you go to the beach. 
you still have the same people doing the things, but the, but the experience is enhanced. Do you know that they now have robots that act as lifeguards? I didn't see them, but I saw an advertisement for them because I was in an area that was marketing those. So everybody is just looking for a better way to improve and enhance, and I think that's what we've got to do. We've got to, in education, continue to look for ways that make the experience more engaging and make it better for those students. So I want you to listen just for a minute about what students want. And these are some younger students, uh, elementary we're gonna hear from this time, telling us a little bit about sit back and listen to what will make our experience a little better for us in school. Sit down, we need to talk. We know you've been trying your best, but you need to realize. We're not kids anymore. Well, we are kids. But being a kid today is different from when you were a kid back in the olden days. Being a student these days is different too. We don't do chalk. We're into things that kick. And click. And scroll and slide. For us, it's got to be fast. Dynamic. Real time, baby. We know change can be a scary thing. doesn't have to be. And when it comes to my education, my education, my education, this stuff's important. Really important. Because before you know it, that whole future thing, yeah, it'll be ours. Us. Can you say, under new management? And we need to be ready. No joke. So, you've got a lot of work to do. Because you know, as well as we do, that we're always learning. We know you can do it. You've got lots of potential. You have the power. So it's time to get cracking. We hope this little talk has helped. Now, off you go. And remember, be watching. Okay always learning. That's one of the critical attributes that we've learned um, out of being a participant with the Next Generation Learning Group. And for some of you who don't know, we've been involved now for three years with a group of people across the state of Kentucky who are really trying to push the limits on thinking outside of the box for what it's going to take to prepare our students to be next generation learners. And we're working with several other states as well who are doing this. And we'll all be applying um, soon for a Race to the Top grant together in hopes that we can get some real money generated to bring more and more technology into the classroom for engagement. Not to take over the learning, but to really engage and supplement the learning that's already happening in our classroom. When I was on my vacation, I was thinking learning how to access that speaker and charge things and manipulate all of the tools that I had, really the things that I was doing is, are related to the six critical attributes for the next generation of learning. I was doing something that I was personally interested, invested in learning. I actually had had at the end of my uh, experience a performance-based learning activity where I could show that I'd mastered the ability to use that speaker. And I was learning anywhere, anytime. Even though I was on vacation, I didn't have to take a class to learn that. I could learn it there because I had the time. And that's what our students do. They manipulate and play with that. Authentic student voice. You heard the students on the video, but we also are listening intently to our kids who are saying, let us have the tools. Let us take over using them. We can do the work. Um, so a lot of the skills that, that I was applying, even while I was on vacation, are really fall in line with the six critical attributes. We had some teachers this summer and last summer go through some training on performance-based learning and project-based learning that, that in the end students are able to create something to show us that they've mastered the content. 
So for the next prize opportunity, I'd like to see if any of those brave teachers would like to stand up and tell us about one of the projects either that they tried last year or something that they might want to apply um, for the following year. And it doesn't have to be a high school teacher. If you've done a project-based learning opportunity in elementary or middle school, if you would like to share it with the group, I think we would love to hear from a few of our teachers now just to hear what you've done that really applies to this, this critical attribute. I'm Connie Bainham, and last year I had the opportunity to be teaching Ascent Arts. So this involved middle school students from all of our middle schools. But our project was to create three videos. And the videos were to have the audience of elementary students. So this meant that there was a lot of collaboration. The artists created the characters. The drama students came in and used those characters, gave them personalities, and wrote the script. And then the um, musicians actually came in and wrote a score. It turned out that Socrates was the main character in all three videos. So we have three videos, Socrates says, and he teaches in a very humorous way. If you're familiar with Gromit and Wallace, the British comedians, well, our students did even better than that. They have you laughing about procrastination. <laughs> um, the golden rule, which is how to treat one another. And I can't think of the third one, but I'm very proud of the project because we have three finished videos that will go to our fifth graders that were created by our middle school students. Thank you, Connie. Can I Okay, in order to do some of these things, we have to have comprehensive systems of learning support. And for those of you who haven't dove in yet to the SITS program, you will be this year. The idea, this is KDE's attempt to really help support and also to help facilitate collaboration between our teachers across the state. This is their method of connecting the standards um, really electronically allowing us to have resources that we can all share and, and build using the technology that's available. And they've used the race to the top money that they received at the state level to design and build this system. As a district this year, we have asked Ed Bonhaus to make himself available to support all teachers. That will be his main focus throughout the school year, will be to help support teachers in implementing the SITS program so that you can have that connectivity that you need. Our students can go outside now of our classroom and get the kinds of supports that they need. How many of you have ever heard of Khan Academy? A few of you. Is there one volunteer that would like to stand up and, and share if you've actually used that in your class? Has anybody used it that you want to share an experience? Okay, well, I'm going to show you a little clip of Khan Academy because I was fortunate enough this spring to actually get to hear Sal Khan speak. And when I came back, I said, free. It's a free resource that could supplement some of what we're doing in our class, especially reaching those students who aren't getting the material at the same pace as everyone else is getting. And I had picked out a very short clip but realized that if enough of you hadn't yes. seen it, you need, to hear the whole, you need to hear the whole background story on how this got started. Because there are some misconceptions of online learning taking over for teachers. And that is absolutely not what's behind Sal Khan's approach. It's about supplementing. Teachers are still the number one predictor of student achievement. But this is about enhancing what's going on in the class and allowing you to have more personalized learning opportunities, easier access to differentiation, and kids can do it anywhere, anytime. So it is a little bit of a longer clip than I would normally show, but I think it's important for you to have the background information. In ends Sanjay Gupta on assignment for 60 minutes. Take a moment and remember your favorite teacher. Now imagine that teacher could reach exactly what Sal Khan is doing on his website, Khan Academy. With digital lessons and simple exercises, he's determined to transform how we learn at every level. 
One of his most famous pupils, Bill Gates, says, Khan, this teacher to the world, is giving us all a glimpse of the future of education. The story will continue in a moment. Thirty-five-year-old Sal Khan may look like a bicycle messenger, but with three degrees from MIT and an MBA from Harvard, his errand is intensely intellectual. In his tiny office above a tea shop in Silicon Valley, he settles in to do what he's done thousands of times before. We've talked a lot now about the demand curve and consumer surplus. Now let's think about the supply curve. He's recording a 10-minute economics lesson. It's so simple. All you hear is his voice, and all you see is his colorful sketches on a digital blackboard. In this video, we're going to talk about the law of demand. When Khan finishes the lecture, he uploads it to his website, where it joins the more than 3,000 other lessons he's done. In just a couple of years, he's gone from having a few hundred pupils to more than four million every month. Has it sunk in to you that you are probably the most watched teacher in the world now? Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I try not to say things like that to myself. You don't want to think about it too much because it can, I think, paralyze you a little bit. So if we get rid of the percent sign, we move the decimal over. He's amassed a library of math lectures. 12 plus 4 is 16. Starting with basic addition and building all the way through advanced calculus. Right, we're taking the limited delta x approach to zero. The exact same thing. But he's not just a math whiz. He has this uncanny ability to break down even the most complicated subjects, including physics, biology, astronomy, history, medicine. How much reading do you do ahead of time? It, it depends what I'm doing. If I'm doing something that I haven't visited for a long time, you know, since high school, I'll go buy five textbooks in it, and I'll try to read every textbook. I'll read whatever I can find on the Internet. Let's talk about one of the most important biological processes. Sal Khan has tackled so many subjects that if you watch just one of his lectures a day, it would take over eight years to cover it all. It's a huge time scale. Magnetic North is kind of the geographic location. And then let's say that this is the point X is equal to basic one. introduction. Light. If this does not blow your mind, you, you have no emotion. Did you ever think about putting yourself visually in the video? Look, if there's a human face there, especially a funny looking human face, then it's actually hard to focus on the math. 4,000 is 2,000 times 3 is 6,000. I don't have to shave, I don't have to comb my hair, I just press record, make a video, there might be spinach in my teeth, who cares? The format is so simple. Why does it appeal to so many people? I've gotten a lot of feedback. It really does feel like I'm, I'm sitting next to the person and we're looking at the paper together. And let me get my trusty calculator out. I'm 95% of the time working through that problem real time or I'm thinking it through myself if I'm explaining something. And to see that it is actually sometimes a messy process, that you know, it isn't always this clean process where you just know the answer. Um, I think that's what people like, the kind of humanity there. It all started in 2004, when Sal Khan was working as a hedge fund analyst in Boston, and his cousin Nadia, a seventh grader in New Orleans, was struggling with algebra. He agreed to tutor her remotely and wound up posting lessons on YouTube. They helped Nadia, but then an odd thing happened total strangers started using them too. I started getting feedback like, you know, my child has dyslexia and this is the only thing that's getting into him. I, I got letters from people saying, you know, we're, we're praying for you and your family. That's pretty heady stuff. You know, pe people don't say that type of stuff to a hedge fund analyst normally. <laughs> so in 2009, Khan quit his job and working from a desk set up in his closet, devoted himself full time to Khan Academy. It's a nonprofit with a simple but audacious mission to provide a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. If that goal sounds far-fetched for a guy working in his closet, consider what happened next. There's a website that uh, I've just been using with my kids recently called Khan Academy, K-H-A-N. Just one guy doing some unbelievable 15-minute tutorials. I was like, those videos for Nadia, not Bill Gates. I have, to, I, have to look, I have to take a second look at some of this stuff. That's right. Bill Gates, one of the smartest and richest men in the world, was using Sal Khan's free videos to teach his own kids. Two weeks later, I got a call from, from Larry Cohen, who's Bill Gates' chief of staff, and he, he says, you know, you might have heard, Bill's a fan. And, you know, I'm like shaking. I'm like, yeah, I heard. You know? <laughs> and, and he's like, if you have time, you know, I'd love to fly you up to Seattle. And, and I was looking at my calendar right then and for the month completely blank. I was like, yeah, you know, I think I could, you know, fly in, you know, between like laundry and a bath. <laughs> I, can, I can just say, and meet with Bill. 
That was just two years ago. Today, with the help of more than $15 million in funding, much of it from the Gates Foundation and Google, Khan has been able to hire, with competitive salaries, some of the most talented engineers and designers in the country. The Khan Academy office has the intense vibe of a Silicon Valley startup. The team is working to create software they hope will transform how math is taught in American classrooms. And once they've done all of these, they really understand proper fractions. Right, right. We visited a class in the Los Altos School District outside San Francisco, where the new Khan Academy software is being piloted. Grab your computer, log in, and then open Khan Academy. Right away, you notice something different. There are no oh, textbooks and no teacher lecturing at the blackboard. Instead, students watch Khan videos at home the night before to learn a concept. Then they come to class the next day and do problem sets called modules to make sure they understand. If they get stuck, they can get one-on-one -on -one help from the teacher. Less lecturing, more interaction. What you think of as homework, you do at school. And schoolwork, you do at home. It's called flipping the classroom. And seventh grader Laureen Forger says using Khan Academy at home has given her math a big boost. I'm not a big fan of textbooks. I thought that Khan Academy was a lot easier because it's on a screen. It's easy to find the concept you want to do. And now with the videos, do you find yourself rewinding it, playing it again if you need to? A lot, yeah. You do that at home? Yeah, usually when I watch a video, it's because I'm having trouble on the practices. So if I don't understand the video, I can always rewind it or pause it so that I can go back to the module and do what I learned. What, what's the hardest part about learning this way? I don't really think there's a hard part. Even kids who don't have a computer at home can flip the classroom. Eastside Prep in East Palo Alto keeps its computer labs open until 10 p.m. So kids like sixth grader Alex Hernandez can take as much time as they need to learn a concept. My mom, she went to school in Mexico. Some things she can't explain to me, but some, like, she can't. So, like, I take long to, like, try to finish my homework. How did you used to do in math? Pretty bad. Like, at a third grade level math. So, you know, Khan Academy has helped me. It's like, it's like open doors that I couldn't open. It's helped me a lot. A lot of people have talked about the idea that uh, flipping the classroom uh, is, is sort of what's happening here. Uh, you take a little bit of issue with that. I kind of view that as a, as a step in the direction. The ideal direction is using something like Khan Academy for every student to work at their own pace, to master concepts before moving on. And then the teacher using Khan Academy as a tool so that you can have a room of 20 or 30 kids all working on different things, but you can still kind of administrate that chaos. Khan Academy has created a dashboard so teachers like Courtney Cadwell can monitor each student's progress. So right now they're all working on things, and you can see that real time. Yes. So as you sit here and look at the dashboard, you see how the students are doing individually, you see how they're doing as a whole class, yep. and you can figure out who you need to help. Exactly, and here I can track their progress over time. I can see who's rushing ahead, who's lagging behind. I can see if they begin to stagnate. A blue bar indicates a student knows a concept. Orange, they're still working on it. But if a red bar pops up, is kind of the red flag to tell me, hey, it's time to step in and intervene. And I can see... Oh, so you can see not only that it's red, but specifically what the problem what they is. Missed, and you can see the number of seconds they spent on each problem. I feel like I'm using my time more effectively with my students because instead of making the assumption that the entire class is weak in this area and I need to spend time reviewing this, I can really pull those three, four, five kids, do a mini workshop, address those needs and allow those other students to move on to problem-solving activities or project-based learning with their peers. So far, the National Education Association has supported nonprofit technology like Khan Academy in the classroom, as long as teachers are trained properly. But as with any new innovation, Khan says there are always some skeptics. I've seen some subset of teachers who say, oh, what is this video thing? You know, uh, live human interaction is important. And the reason why that, that bothers me a little bit is that, no, that's exactly what we're saying. In fact, we exactly agree with you that what we're trying to do is take the passivity out of the classroom so that you as a teacher will have more flexibility. Does it minimize the role of the teacher? Does it make it less impactful? No, I think it's the exact opposite. We kind of view teachers playing the role of more like a coach or a mentor, which, once again, I personally believe is a much higher value thing than a lecturer. Khan Academy's math program is being piloted in 23 schools, mostly in California. Preliminary test scores from a handful of classrooms have shown improvements. 
especially for students who are struggling. Official state assessments will be available this summer. In the meantime, Chief Operating Officer Shantanu Sinha says they're gathering massive amounts of data, not just from American classrooms, but from every Khan Academy user around the world. So you could say how many problems were done over the last 24 hours? How many was it? Right now, in the last 24 hours, we had close to 1.8 million. Wow. Not total, but just one yep. day. Yes, in a 24-hour period. And when you take a look at total users over the last 18 months... 41 million visits from the United States. We can look, you know, from India, we had 1.7 million, Australia, 1.4 million. Right. It is pretty amazing to think that millions of people all over the world are using Khan Academy right now. Yeah. I mean, it's a gold mine on how to understand, you know, what, what paths through learning are most effective. Khan says they look at all that data and constantly make changes to their software platform. We can start fine-tuning things the way that Amazon might fine-tune their button to help you buy that book or find the book that you want. Or Netflix says, what's the right movie for you? We now get to do with education. Eric Schmidt, the pioneering chairman of Google, says he's seen a lot of failed attempts to integrate technology into education, but says what Sal Khan is doing is different. Many, many people think they're doing something new, but they're not really changing the approach. Because with Saul, he said, what we're going to do is not only we're going to make these interesting 10-minute videos, but we're going to measure whether it works or not. He was the guy to sort of make this happen? Why do you think it was him and not some person who was an educator or who had a background in this area? Innovation never comes from the established institutions. It's always a graduate student or a crazy person or somebody with a great vision. Saul is that person in education, in my view. He built a platform. If that platform works, that platform could completely change education in America. 17 over 9 is equal to 1.88. Inside classrooms, it's just Khan Academy math for now. But Sal Khan believes his strategy can be used to teach subjects like history and science. And not just in elementary schools, but high schools and even colleges. But no matter how big or how successful Khan Academy gets, Sal Khan promises he'll never put a price tag on it. The for-profits have to mold themselves much more to the education establishment than we do. As a not-for-profit, we're just like, what's our mission? To educate children as well as possible. I've said it enough times, and it's in our mission statement, a free world-class education for anyone anywhere. And that's what sixth grader Alex Hernandez says he needs. Has anyone in your family ever gone to college? No. So that's a pretty big deal for you? you think you're going to be able to do it? With help or like with more like studying or like Khan Academy, I think I can get there. I think you can too. All right, so you can see there were a lot of examples in there of the six attributes that I talked about earlier with the world-class knowledge and skills. And what Saul Khan is doing is he's making that accessible to anyone in the world. So for the first time, and I think that's why uh, Bill Gates got so excited about it because that's been a mission of his foundation as well, is to make sure that the world is educated. So after watching that, uh, before we move forward, does anyone have ideas now of how you might want to use that and integrate it into your classroom that you'd like to share? Not sure if this would be appropriate, but I immediately thought of RTI. Would that work for RTI or not? Oh, for RTI? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Okay. That was my first thought about using it, with R using it for RTI interventions. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to share? It's hard for me to see in the dark, so you may have to stand up if I can't catch you. Okay. Well, think about it because I think as a free resource, we too often get hung up because we can't afford something. And now with the access to the Internet and it's free, uh, there are over 3,000 videos now and his group of engineers are continuing to, to make more and to enhance those. So keep an eye on it and think about ways you might want to try to use that. Um, also on my summer vacation, I'm going back to my theme, um, the Olympics were on. And this was something different, too, because as I watch the Olympics, I'm thinking, it's the same games, the same rules. I mean, they've added, some, they've added some events, and they've taken away some events. But for the most part, it's, it's the same rules and the same games. But, boy, do the people perform so much better. And I kept hearing about their performances, and, and you could watch um, special shows just showing you how they use data to increase their speed 
and they had they used technology and new equipment to make them stronger. So again, the games are the same, the functions the same, competing globally is the same. But what has changed is how they're using the data and how they're actually increasing their strength. But something that really hit me this time, and I'm sure it was true four years ago, it just wasn't prominent in my head, and that is the access to the coverage via Twitter and Facebook. So you could find out any time, live time nearly, who won the races. And, you know, I'm kind of old school. I like to wait and watch it on TV and see it firsthand. But I did have to, I did have to look a couple of times on Twitter to see what was going on. And I know that's how our kids do it. They want immediate, they want information right now. They don't want to wait until tonight. That's old school. That's what we do. That's not what they do. The other thing that happened while I was on vacation that was uh, significant, another form of social media that kept me informed was while I was gone, we had this series of bad storms that went through, and actually a tree fell on our truck. And we were able to see it on Facebook before the electricity went out. Isn't that amazing? So you could find out live. So anything, when you're away now, you're not really away. You're just a moment away if you've got a piece of technology at your hands. So finally, I want to leave you with one clip because I think, um, as we've talked about all of those attributes of next generation learning, you're going to see a video clip that Intel put together on our future. And a lot of this technology is currently available. You're going to see collaboration with outside agencies. These are middle school students doing a project-based learning activity um, and actually coming to a, having a performance event at the end. And so I want to leave you with this video, and then we'll have a few minutes for question and answers. Pretty cool, isn't it? 
our kids are going to have the opportunity to experience that in their school career. The technology is out there and coming, and those companies are not slowing down. It's just a matter of how we can keep up with them. So I'm going to leave you with this final visual. Um, we have a lot of work to do, and we have a lot of challenges to stay on top of this. I can't tell you how many hours I spent looking at all the new technology out there. And some of it that you Google and search for is already dated. We're already implementing a lot of what's out there saying this is coming in the future. So it's hard to stay on top of it. But in the end, it's OK to go back to what we know is working and start from there. It's OK to go back to the beach. It's OK to go back to what you're comfortable with and try to enhance the experience. What we're looking for is really a higher level of student engagement because we know we can get at those concepts at a deeper level when kids are doing the work and kids are truly engaged in that. So I want to wish you guys a great year. I will be around, and hopefully if you have something innovative, uh, before Christmas I plan to be in every building for a full day. Uh, I'm going to offer up what's called 10 Minutes with Terry. So if you want to talk to me one-on-one -on -one and share what you're doing or share any concerns or share any positives or just share perceptions, that's what I'll be there to hear and listen. But just think about it. If you want if you want to try some things with someone in another building, I know Jason stood up earlier and talked. You want to see how that's going. Start collaborating. Use those resources we have now to talk to each other and really share across the board because this is becoming a global learning environment. So at the very least, we've got to pull together and try to learn from each other. So have a great year. If you were participating on today's meet, be sure to check in up here so that you can get your participation prize as well. Think about how you might want to use those speakers in your class because I'll probably ask that question next year when we get back together. So have a great PGA and welcome back.